four. <clears throat> so last time uh, we sort of finished up talking about uh, density and uh, a reminder that density is uh, basically equal to mass divided by volume. And that is a formula that you should be able to rearrange uh, if we solve for volume. Uh, that would be mass divided by density. And if we solve for mass, that would be volume times density. Common units of density are grams per milliliter or grams per cubic centimeter. And that's typically what we see for solids and liquids. And again, as we talked about, a milliliter is the same as a sort of cubic centimeter here. The density of a substance determines whether or not it will sink or float. So if something is more dense, for example, than water, it will sink. If something is less dense than water, it will uh, definitely float. So, <clears throat> let's take a look at this. A very common way uh, that we do get volume for density um, is by volume by displacement. So, there's really sort of three ways that we can get a volume. Uh, the first volume. Our first way to get a volume is pretty straightforward. You just simply take a reading. So you just take a reading of the meniscus in a graduated cylinder or something like that, uh, where you can take the reading. Another very common way uh, that we could get a volume is uh, for solids by taking three length measurements, the length times the width times the height, all in centimeters. That gives us a cubic centimeter, uh, which again is a volume in this case. And really the sort of third common way that we get volume and very, very common in density is what is known as volume by displacement. So volume by displacement basically means that if you take a container uh, such as a graduated cylinder and you put some say water in it or some type of liquid, if you then take something that is solid and put it into that container, what will happen is uh, our guy will go in. And what we would see is a rise in the volume, right? So that when you put the solid in, the volume level is going to rise to a final volume. And this is what is known as volume by displacement. It's a very simple and easy way that you can figure out the volume of a solid object. You basically just dump it into like some water and you take an initial and final reading. The volume of the object in this case will always be the final volume minus the initial volume. And that is a very, very common way that uh, we determine volume when we're dealing with density uh, is to basically take the difference of the two. So there's really three sort of ways that you could get the volume. Uh, like I said, just take a direct reading. Uh, you could do some length measurements there and, and multiply them together. Or again, if you just have a solid object, drop it in some liquid and get the difference in the levels of both of those liquids. And that will give you the volume of the object. So for example, here in this uh, example, they took some type of solid that had a mass of 68.60. Uh, we took the volume of the zinc. Initially, it was 35.5. Then it basically raised up to 45.0 milliliters. The difference here when we do our subtraction is 9.5. And when we do something like volume by displacement here, it does have an effect of sometimes on how many significant figures our answer should end up with. And in this particular case, we would finally be dividing the mass by the volume. The mass has four significant figures, our volume has two. So we should end up with two significant figures here for the density. Now the density units do not cancel because grams are on top and milliliters on the bottom here. So you do keep both units. Uh, the number always stays with the grams part and it is always uh, one milliliter or one cubic centimeter uh, for the bottom. You could also use density if you're given the density. Let's just say we have a density of an object was 7.54 grams per milliliter. 
And <clears throat> we wanted to know, what do we wanna know? Let's do, what is the mass of 325 milliliters of the solution? So we can use the density really as like a conversion factor. So although it does say obviously 7.54 grams per milliliter, you could flip it around and put milliliters up on top and 7.54 grams on the bottom and kind of use it as a conversion factor where you would basically treat it like a dimensional analysis type problem. We know that we have 325 milliliters of the solution to get rid of milliliters. We would need to use the sort of conversion factor like it is there. And that would give us 7.54 grams per milliliter. Milliliters here would cancel and we would end up uh, with 2450.5 grams. Significant figure wise, I should end up with how many significant figures? I should end up with three. That's three, and that is three. And we're really multiplying here, right? And dividing. So this should end up at three, which takes us to there. So, like a 2450, no decimal uh, would do the job in terms of the correct number of significant figures in that particular case. So, you can definitely kind of use. Uh, the density has like a conversion factor and just sort of approach the problem as sort of dimensional analysis with units. Sometimes that's easier than maybe just remembering the formula. This way you just think of it like a conversion problem, get rid of the units you don't want, keep the units that you do want. So sometimes, you know, it's a helpful sort of move. Any questions on that there? Okay. All right. Uh, uh, why don't you try this one here? I think that's different than that. Perfect. What is the density in grams per milliliter of 48 grams of a sample of metal? Okay, let's take a look. So obviously uh, we're looking for density, which is mass divided by volume. In this case, we have 48.0 grams, which would be a mass. We have that. The volume here, we have our initial and our final volume. So this again is volume by displacement. So the volume of the object that went in there, if I could draw straightish lines, is basically the volume difference between those two. So the volume of the object here would be our final volume minus our initial volume. Our final volume being 33.0, our initial volume being 25.0. That gives us an 8.0 milliliters as the volume of the object, which would be obviously the bottom part that we need there for the density. At this point, we could put in our numbers. Density would be our 48.0 grams divided by our 8.0 milliliters. And gives us 6.0 grams per milliliter in this case as the density. Any questions on that one? The significant figures here is really based off of which part of the calculation? It is based off of the subtraction part, right? So when we subtracted, we should go to decimal places, which is one decimal place in each. That is why this is not just eight, but it's 8.0. It would be the correct answer for that. That has one decimal place, but two sig figs, which is important when we do the last calculation, which is dividing, that would be three sig figs divided by two sig figs, gives us two significant figures for our answer in that case, yeah. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> That's good, they agree, I like it. All right, so if the volume and density of a sample is volume, uh, we obviously have the density given to us, which is uh, 1.32 grams per milliliter. We also have the mass given to us, uh, which is 14.7 grams. So if you're not sure where you should go next, obviously volume is the only thing that we do not have, which is actually what we're looking for. If you rearrange it, volume would be multiplied to the other side, density would be divided back to the other side. Once again, if you don't really wanna maybe worry too much about this, since you do have density, 
You could again treat it as like a conversion factor to look something like this. And you basically just take a unit approach here. We definitely want to get rid of grams, which is 14.7 grams. Remember to get rid of it. Opposites will work. So it's going to be this as a conversion factor to do so. Maybe 1.32 grams. Grams will cancel. We'll take uh, basically what we had up on top, 14.7 divided by 1.32, gonna give us 11.13636 uh, and so forth milliliters in this case. <clears throat> Sig figs should end up at three, which would be right there. So 11.1 milliliters. So again, you definitely could take a dimensional analysis sort of approach to it and just really cancel out the units you don't want, keep the units you do want, or obviously if you plugged and chugged it into this equation, it's really the same calculation as you did there. So whichever way you want to do it will be fine. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when they're not so when uh, you add and subtract you go by uh, decimal places smallest number of decimal places that is a rule yes yeah. so if you add or subtract uh, smallest number of decimal places if you multiply or divide smallest number of significant figures so sig yeah so you you want to technically keep track of your uh, significant figures through every step that you do in the calculation and really the last step, um, whatever math you're going to do there in the last step is really the one that's going to really tell you what the end should be. But you do have to kind of keep track of it uh, throughout. So like the last one, you wouldn't want to just put eight, which is what you get when you subtract those two numbers, just as eight, because that would give you one sig fig, then would it give you the wrong number of significant figures on your final answer when you divided. So that's why it was important to recognize that you actually should have took it to 8.0, which is two sig figs, which is important for the next step of the calculation. Other questions? <clears throat> yeah. All right, they agree, so that's good. All right, uh, let's try one more here. John took uh, two teaspoons of cough syrup. If the syrup had a density of 1.2 grams per milliliter and there are five milliliters in a teaspoon. Okay, so once again, we're dealing with density. So we'll put our equation in there. Uh, we definitely have the density given to us, which is 1.20 grams per milliliter. Once again, we can use that as a conversion factor. Uh, we can put the milliliters on top of 1.20 grams on the bottom. Uh, we want to know basically uh, the mass here. Uh, so we have the density. So we do need to get the volume. Uh, we do have the volume, which is right now in two teaspoons. The problem obviously with that is the volume there of teaspoons and the volume of milliliters do not work together. So we do need to convert it from teaspoons to milliliters. So we could use another conversion that was given to us in the problem, five milliliters equals one teaspoon. So using that to convert us into milliliters. So we're in the correct units. We'll do a little dimensional analysis here. The teaspoons will cancel. That's gonna give us 10 going to give us 10 milliliters. There we go. Now, the reason we did that is we could definitely use that with our density here, which is in milliliters. So now we're good on our volume. Once again, the mass is volume times density. Taking the dimensional analysis approach, we'll take our 10 milliliters. We'll use our density just like it's written there, 1.2 grams on top, milliliters on the bottom. Milliliters will cancel, gives us 1.2 times 10, basically. And that's going to give us 12 grams of cough syrup here. Any questions on that calculation there? <clears throat> So once again, two sig figs really based off of this number here, really, uh, that is two, that gives us two. So when we finish it out, we got three sig figs and two sig figs, giving us two sig figs there for the answer. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> there we go. 
Any questions on density? Yeah. All right, so that finally wraps up chapter two. We're going to roll now to chapter four, the specific gravity that's on your note. Okay, so we're up to uh, chapter four here. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to obviously talk about atoms. Uh, we're going to talk about protons, electrons, neutrons, talk a little bit about some of the experiments that led to the structure of the atom. We'll talk about protons, electrons, neutrons, atomic number, mass number. And we will also talk about electron configuration. And if that's not enough, I think we'll talk about the periodic table in this chapter as well. So a lot going on in this chapter. So let us get to it. Uh, obviously, elements, as we might have talked about before, really uh, as far back as you could go in terms of substances. Uh, they're the basic building blocks, pretty much of everything, compounds and stuff like that. The basic units of, of elements are atoms. Atoms, as we will talk about here, contain protons, electrons, and neutrons. So these are really the particles that make up an atom. And depending on how many you have, for example, of protons, it uh, tells you pretty much what element you are dealing with. Obviously, the elements we have there are on the periodic table. Now, the elements, when we deal with them, uh, they do have symbols. And symbols are really written one of two ways. They are either written as a one-letter symbol. And if it is a one-letter symbol, then it is always capitalized, like K is potassium, uh, S is sulfur, F is fluorine. So if you have sort of a one-letter uh, symbol, it is always capitalized. If it is two letters, it is always capitalized on the first letter, and the second one is not. So there's our aluminum. Um, Fe is iron. Sn is tin, um, Sb is antimony, Ag is silver, Au is gold. So they're always capitalized. The first one, second one is not. The reason we don't want to capitalize both of them, for example, if we take CO and capital C and capital O, uh, these are actually two very different things. Uh, CO is cobalt, an element. Capital C, capital O is carbon monoxide, which is not an element, it's a compound. So if you're somebody that capitalizes everything, you definitely don't wanna capitalize you know, all the letters in a symbol. Otherwise you may be writing something you're not intending to write. So capital first letter, lowercase second, unless it's a one symbol uh, capital uh, letter for that guy. And A, for example, is sodium. Elements are pure substances from which all other things are built. As I've mentioned, they're kind of like the alphabet. Different combinations will give you different compounds uh, and different substances. They are as far back as you could go. You cannot break them down any further. There are a number of elements that actually do come as molecules, which I think we might have talked about earlier, but just in case, uh, like H2O2, N2, F2, Cl2, Br2 and I2. All these guys are elements, and this is how each of these guys come when they are by themselves, uncombined, not attached to anybody else. So if you have hydrogen, it's never one hydrogen by itself. It's actually two hydrogens that are attached to each other. If you got uh, oxygen, it is two oxygens that are attached to each other. Uh, so this is naturally how they come. These are what are referred to as being diatomic molecules. Di meaning two, atomic meaning atoms, and molecules is a definition that means simply there are two or more atoms together. So if you have a molecule, it means two or more atoms are together. Um, and again, that's different than a compound, which I think we might have went over a little bit in the first chapter. It seems familiar to me, I think. Um, <clears throat> any questions on that there? So here are some of the elements and their names. Um, and they do come from a wide variety of sources. Some come from historical names. Some come from uh, people who invented it, if you will. Uh, some come from where they were invented. You know, it's how we get things like Californium, right? Francium and all those kind of things. Nobelium, Einsteinium for people who invented it. Um, 
And uh, some are, again, why we have some different symbols than you might think. Like, for example, copper is not CO, it's actually CU. And again, iron is Fe instead of an I, like it might think makes sense to you. It's actually based off of ferrate is sort of where that comes from, which is why it's Fe rather than I and stuff like that. Um, as I mentioned, some other ones that might be unfamiliar, Ag is silver, Au is gold, Hg is actually mercury. So that's like one that sometimes messes people up. This is uranium, which is U. And uh, other than that, they're not on that periodic table, but that's on the bottom two rows on the periodic tables where you find uranium. Uh, we won't deal too much with those guys. Again, you can see like this one, uh, you know, from where it comes from and obviously named after people as well. So as I mentioned, the chemical symbols, definitely uh, capital letter and capital and lowercase. And here's some common elements. So which one should you know? You should know everything. I'm just kidding, I don't know. It will probably help you when we get into naming coming up next, uh, but on the periodic table, we do come across a lot on the left-hand side, the first two or sort of groups. Uh, there's usually that like staircase. So kind of the upper part of the staircase and a little bit in this region here, kind of like the right center and the bottom two rows. We, we don't do too much of those guys on the periodic table. They do pop up occasionally, uh, but kind of extreme left, extreme right. And then kind of top to the right is sort of where we uh, end up. So, I would recommend if you don't have a good handle on the symbols that go with uh, certain ones that you take some time to learn them. It will definitely help you when we get into the naming part, uh, because obviously when we get into the naming part, there's rules of how you name everything. So if you're still struggling to figure out, you know, what copper symbol is or something like that is going to make it a lot harder on you. So uh, I definitely would sort of try to do that. Uh, here we have some symbols here. So iodine is I. And that is the symbol for it, although when it is by itself, it does come as two, but we don't usually write I2 for the symbol. We just obviously write I. Iron, as I mentioned, is Fe. Magnesium is capital M, lowercase g. Zinc is capital Z and lowercase n. And lithium is capital L and lowercase i. So again, those are the proper way to write those symbols. Any questions on those there? They agree, so that's good. All right. All right, so if we roll through some of these names here, we got P, which is phosphorus. We got AR, which is argon. We have MN, which is manganese, not magnesium, but manganese. BE is beryllium. And K is potassium. I'm going to put that page because I butchered beryllium, I think, very badly. I knew there was an Y in there. So even though I can't remember all of the spelling. <laughs> so that is beryllium, uh, potassium, manganese, argon, and phosphorus. So again, really important to sort of get a handle on those symbols and names, as it will definitely come in handy as we get there to naming. All right, so we're now talk about really the structure of the atom and some of the events and experiments that led us to sort of the understanding of how the atom is. The atom, as I mentioned, is really the simplest representation of all the elements uh, that we have. Uh, for the most part, every element except for hydrogen has protons, electrons, and neutrons. As we'll talk about, hydrogen is actually the only one that does not have a neutron. So everybody else has all three. One of the earliest sort of ideas about atoms came from a guy named Dalton. He came up with what is referred to as Dalton's atomic theory. And not all parts of his theory are still correct, but some parts are correct and some parts are not correct. So let's take a look at Dalton's atomic theory and some of the parts that are maybe still correct and not so correct as we go through it. Uh, he said basically that all matter is made up of tiny particles called atoms. Uh, so that is correct. 
He said that all atoms of a given element are identical to one another and that atoms of different elements uh, are different from one another. This is actually not correct anymore. Um, all atoms of a given element are not identical. The presence of what are known as isotopes uh, basically sort of eliminated that idea. Isotopes, as we'll talk about, are really the same element, but they have different masses. So obviously, if they have different masses, they are not identical to each other. One weighs more than the other, and it's really because they actually have more neutrons than the other one as well. So uh, that later sort of discovered isotopes sort of eliminated that as being correct still. Atoms of two or more different elements combine to form compounds. Uh, compounds always made of uh, the same kind of atoms and uh, same number of each atom that's present. A reminder, that's still correct. A reminder, the difference right between a molecule and a compound, which again, I think we covered there in the first chapter. A molecule is just simply two or more atoms together. A compound is two or more atoms of different elements. So that's why something like H2 is both a element because it only contains hydrogen. It's also a molecule because it has two atoms. It is not a compound because it only has hydrogen. Something like water, for example. Water is a molecule because it has two or more atoms. Water is also a compound because it has hydrogen and oxygen, which are two different elements. Water is not an element because it has hydrogen and oxygen together, which obviously are two different elements. So again, that is the difference between those two, which I think we talked about earlier on. A chemical reaction involves really the rearrangement separation of atoms, and they sort of recombine. We don't create nor destroy any atoms in a chemical reaction, and that is still true. That's the basis of balancing equations. If you start with four carbons, you should end with four carbons. Everybody might be in different sort of compounds along the way or substances. Uh, basically, well, all that happens in a chemical reaction is simply all the bonds on the reactants break apart. Then they all sort of reassemble together and make new bonds on the other side. So we never lose any elements along the way in a chemical reaction. Uh, we always have the conservation of elements from starting to end. Again, they may just be in different sort of compounds at the end. The other part of Dalton Sonic theory that sort of was not true is that atoms are indestructible. Uh, through nuclear reactions, you could actually change the element from one to another. It doesn't really happen in chemical reactions, but in nuclear reactions, you could actually, you know, take one element to a different one by changing the number of protons. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so there was this idea that although atoms are very, very small, they actually do contain a internal structure, and they are sometimes referred to as subatomic particles. And our subatomic particles are protons, neutrons, and electrons. As we will talk about, protons are positively charged. Electrons are negatively charged. And neutrons are basically no charge. Yeah. So all atoms are basically made up of these uh, smaller particles. And as I mentioned before, depending on sort of how many of these guys that you have, uh, will tell you basically what element you are dealing with. An important idea, as we might have talked about, but just to reiterate, there's this idea in chemistry, and it's a very big principle that happens in a lot of situations, and it's the idea of opposites attract. So again, much like in life, you know, if you have two positive people, they don't really want to be near each other, right? So they will repel each other. Two negative people can't stand to be around each other either, right? So they will sort of repel each other. They always say you need an opposite, right? So the positive person, negative person balances each other out. Same thing here in chemistry. If you have anything that has the same type of charge, it definitely does not want to be near each other. So it will repel each other. It will try to get away as far as possible. But things that have opposite charges are always attracted to each other. And the basis of a lot of interaction that occurs in chemistry is this basic interaction of, I have something that's positively charged, I have something that's negatively charged, and they're going to be attracted to one another. The attraction is what's referred to as electrostatic attraction.
And the attraction also increases with the charge. So the larger the positive and negative charge, they are gonna be held together a lot tighter than if you had a smaller positive and negative charge. So if you had like a plus three and a minus three, they will come together a lot stronger than if you had like a plus one and minus one, uh, they will still come together, but not as strong. So you kind of think of it like a magnet, right? You got a bigger sort of magnet, like a bigger charge. It's gonna really grab whatever that's gonna paperclip. Uh, if you got kind of a smaller magnet, it will still grab it, but it will take a little while to, for it to kind of come over and, and attach. So it's sort of that idea. So one of the really biggest sort of advancement in understanding these subatomic particles uh, began with a guy named Thompson. He did experiments which are referred to as CRT sort of experiments. CRT stands for a cathode ray tube. A cathode ray tube is pretty much a guy that will shoot negatively charged particles. And this would be going towards a side that's more positive away from a side that's more negative. So there'll be this like electrical field. The negatively charged particles would head towards the positively charged side and be attracted. He was able to do a lot of experiments with these. And you may be familiar with CRT tubes. Maybe you're old enough. Older TVs, you know, like really older ones as well that were on the ground. They had like a big back to them and stuff like that. Those had CRT tubes in it. You could take off the back. It's like the picture tube basically is what that was. You put some fluorescence on the front. So when the thing hits, you could see everything light up. Older computer monitors that have like the big back, not like that, but like the big back that used to come out. Those used to be CRT monitors and they also had cathode ray tubes. So they actually were in a lot of uh, electronics and stuff like that for a lot of years. Not anymore. Obviously those do not have them in there. Uh, but using this, what Thompson was able to basically figure out was the charge to mass of an electron. And him, along with another really important experiment, which was done by a guy named Milligan. I can spell that there. Milligan. He did what is known as the oil drop experiment. And basically what he did with the oil drop experiment was he had a magnet electrical field. He shot pieces, uh, droplets of oil into this chamber. And what he was able to do basically was he was able to adjust the electrical field in a way that the oil droplet pretty much just hung there. It wouldn't fall up, down, it just kind of hung there. And what he was able to figure out from that was really the charge on an electron. And from those two pieces of experiments, really the mass of an electron was able to be discovered. And it was found that the mass of an electron is actually a pretty small number. It's like 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus 27 grams. It's a very, very small sort of number. But what actually came up was Thompson came up with a very early model of the atom. And the early model of the atom they came up with is one that is referred to as a plum pudding model. And it's based off of a dessert of pudding that has raisins in it. And basically what he said was the atom is a sphere of positive charge. So all this in here is all positive charge. And embedded inside this positive charge are these negatively charged electrons. So all these guys like the raisins in the dessert are all these negatively charged electrons. And what he said was most of the mass of the atom was the electrons. So you got this really spear of positive charge spread out all over the atom. You got these electrons sort of embedded inside and it's made up most of the mass of the atom are those electrons. And this was sort of the accepted model of the atom for a good period of time until really the next big sort of discovery happened. And it happened with a guy named Rutherford. Rutherford did a gold foil experiment where he shot alpha particles, alpha particles are radioactive positively charged particles. They're really helium basically is what they are. Uh, so he shot these alpha particles at pieces of gold foil, which are basically atoms. And what he expected to happen was because all this is positively charged, thank you. 
he expected that when he shot these positively charged alpha particles at the atom, it would go through with some deflection because you're shooting something that's positively charged or something that's positively charged. So there's going to be some deflection that would happen. So for example, if this whole thing was all the positive charge, right? And I held one end, somebody else held the other end and I like shot a pin at it really hard, right? It would probably would punch through, right? But there'll be a little bit of deflection as it went through. And that's basically what they expected to happen when they did their experiment. They were actually very surprised when they did their experiment. They shot their alpha particles from a radioactive source. This is like a detection screen so they could see where it went. And what they found was for the most part, most of the alpha particles had no problem, just went straight on through, no problem. But what they found was every so often an alpha particle would bounce off at a really large angle and even would maybe come back to where it was shot from, which is probably not good if you're standing there. So these alpha particles really bounce off at these really, really large angles. So what they had to decide was, this is probably not so good, this model of the atom, this sort of plum pudding model. And they tried to explain sort of what they found. So what would account for the reason that the alpha particles just went straight through? What did they hit if they went straight through? They basically hit nothing, yeah? So they pretty much hit empty space, right? So if you shot some particle or something in empty space, it's just going to go straight through. Definitely not going to go anywhere, right? It's because it's not going to hit anything. What would cause these positively charged alpha particles to bounce off at really large angles? What did it have to hit? It had to hit something. If it was negative, what would happen? Would they be attracted to each other? They would, and they wouldn't bounce off, right? They would just stick, right? So it had to hit something that was very positively charged to account for that, because these things are heavy, they're moving really fast. So it had to hit something that was really, really positively charged to make those alpha particles bounce off at these really large angles. So they said, well, it went straight through because there was empty space. It hit something that was densely positively charged, which they call a nucleus. And that accounted for why they saw basically these alpha particles bounce at a really, really large angle. So basically what they had to do was abandon the plum pudding model and come up with really the modern version of the atom, which is an atom is mostly empty space. It has a very positive core known as a nucleus. And as we'll talk about, protons are found in there, which are positively charged. Later on in like 1930, neutrons were found to be in the nucleus, no charge. And out from the nucleus at some distance are the electrons, which are traveling in that empty space. Do electrons travel in pretty circles? They don't, by the way. They actually don't travel in pretty circles. They actually travel pretty randomly about the nucleus. Is there an attractive force between the electrons, which are negatively charged, and the nucleus, which is positively charged? There are, right? That's opposites attract, right? So there is an attraction between those electrons, which are flying around, and the nucleus, which is positively charged. That's why the electrons just don't leave, right? They're kind of tied a little bit to the atom through the attractive force to the nucleus. Some leave a lot easier than others because of their distance from that positive charge. So some are held a lot tighter. So electrons that are closer to the nucleus are held a lot tighter than electrons that are further away from the nucleus, which are known as valence electrons. They're still held, but not as tightly, which is why those valence electrons, for example, are involved in bonding. So Rutherford came up with really the modern version of the atom that again, it contains a nucleus, which is positively charged. It is mostly empty space. And most of the mass of the atom is actually the nucleus. So most of the mass of the atom is the nucleus where we find protons and neutrons basically housed. That is because out of the three particles, subatomic particles, protons, neutrons 
and electrons, both a proton and a neutron is about 1800 times heavier than an electron. So individually, a proton or a neutron is individually about 18 heavy, 1800 times heavier than any electron that's flying around. And that's why it makes sense that most of the atom's mass is made up of the nucleus because those two particles are basically found in the nucleus and they both are 1800 times heavier than any electron that is basically flying around. The actual heaviest particle is a neutron is actually the heaviest. The proton is super close to mass, but it's just barely nudged out by a neutron. The lightest of all those three particles is the electron. Again, about 1800 times lighter than a proton or a neutron. Any questions on that there? So uh, you do need to know the structure of the atom. Again, nucleus, protons, positively charged, neutrons, no charge found inside the nucleus. Electrons, which are negatively one charged, are flying around on the outside in the empty space. Most of the mass of the atom is made up of the nucleus. Any questions on that there? So let's talk a little bit about atomic mass unit. Atomic mass unit is the mass of an atom. And uh, although... We do use it occasionally, atomic mass unit. We don't use it a lot in calculations later on, uh, but an AMU is uh, what is referred to as the atomic mass unit. Now, chemists basically chose a isotope of carbon to be uh, basically what we use to figure out the atomic mass of each atom or element. And they used the carbon-12 isotope which had a mass of exactly 12 AMU. Uh, a proton uh, has a mass of 1.007 AMU. Uh, you can see a neutron just barely beats it out at 1.008 AMU. And again, the smallest out of all of them uh, is our electron at 0 0.00055. It's like basically 9.09 .09 times 10 to the minus 27 grams. So like 27 zeros going that way. Very, very small mass. All right. So again, these are the charges for each of these and where they're located. You do need to know them. Uh, you don't need to know the actual numbers for that one, but you do need to know that it is the neutrons, the heaviest, followed by the proton, and that the electron is the lightest out of all of them. Any questions on that there? All right, so uh, which of the following particles fit each description found outside the nucleus is the electron, yeah. Has a positive charge is the proton. Has mass but no charge is the neutron, right? True or false, the mass of an electron is greater than the mass of a proton. That is false. Remember, it is the lightest out of all of them. Protons have positive charge. Electrons have negative charge. That is true. They each are plus one and minus one, respectively. The nucleus of an atom contains only protons and neutrons. That is true. That is where you find those guys. Yeah. That's good. There we go. So again, uh, the nucleus is like really super small compared to the actual size of the atom. It's kind of like if you're in a football stadium and like on the 50 yard line is the nucleus, the entire stadium is like the rest of the atom, the empty space. This is uh, this kind of bluish area here. It's an electron density. It doesn't look very blue on the screen. Uh, but uh, this is, again, the sort of empty space in here where our electrons are basically flying around the nucleus in a random sort of pattern. Any questions on the structure of the atom? <clears throat> All right, then let's talk about atomic number, mass number, and isotopes. As I mentioned before, um, really most chemical reactions, all chemical reactions really only involve electrons. And if you think about what we just talked about in terms of the structure of the atom, electrons are on the outside, right? So it makes sense when two atoms come together, really it is the electrons that say hello to each other, right? They're the ones that really come in contact with one another. Uh, so all chemical reactions pretty much only involve those electrons being moved from one spot to the next. 
A really important number is the atomic number. And that is what is abbreviated with a Z sometimes. The definition of the atomic number is the number of protons there are in an element. Now, if you have something that is neutral, an atom that is neutral, since there's only three things in an atom, a proton that's positive, an electron that's negatively charged, and a neutron that has no charge. If the guy is neutral, that means all of the protons would have to be the same number of electrons if the thing was going to be neutral, right? Neutral means zero charge. So all the positive guys has to equal all the negative guys. So if you're dealing with a neutral atom, the atomic number, which is the number of protons, will also tell you basically the number of electrons there are. They should be the same number because there is no charge. But it's important to know that if you're asked the question of what is the definition of atomic number, the definition of atomic number is only the number of protons. So if you're asked what is the definition of atomic number, it is only the number of protons, but it will also tell you the number of electrons if it is neutral, but that is not part of the definition, just protons. We can find the atomic number on the periodic table. Uh, we'll look at like fluorine there, which I think is number nine. It is the number that is on top there. That is the atomic number. Which means fluorine would have nine protons, which are positively charged. And if this was neutral, it should then have nine electrons as well to balance it out. Nine positives and nine negatives give you an overall charge of zero. So that everybody balances each other out in this case. Nitrogen is number seven. So if you look on the periodic table and find N, the number above it will be seven, which would be its atomic number. One thing, if you look at a periodic table, you have super good eyes, you can see that periodic table, I doubt it. But if you look on the periodic table, and all the numbers that are on top of the elements, there is no number that repeats. So every single element has its own unique atomic number, which means two things. It means if you know the atomic number and if you know the number of protons, which is really the same thing, you actually know what element you're dealing with because frankly, all you have to do is go to the periodic table and find that number and that will tell you what element you are dealing with. That also means that if you know what element you're dealing with, you simply just need to go to the periodic table, find the number, and it will tell you how many protons there are. And again, if it's neutral, it will also tell you how many electrons there are, which would be the same number. So you will never have a fluorine atom that has seven protons because seven protons is not fluorine. It is actually nitrogen. So uh, they will never, ever have a different number of protons or atomic number. Any questions on that there? Another important number is the mass number. The mass number is abbreviated with an A. The mass number is the number of protons and the number of neutrons there are in an atom. So the mass number, number of protons plus the number of neutrons. That's important because if we take the mass number and the atomic number, which is the number of protons, and we subtract the two, number of protons cancel, and that will tell you the number of neutrons. So if you take the mass number minus the atomic number, that will tell you how many neutrons there are in an atom. Except for hydrogen, as I mentioned earlier, hydrogen actually only has a proton and an electron. Hydrogen does not have a neutron. Every other element will have all three. All other elements will have protons, electrons, and neutrons, except for hydrogen. When you calculate the atomic number, the mass number, the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons, they all should be positive whole numbers. So they all should be whole numbers and positive whole numbers. So that brings up the question of when you go to the periodic table and you look up like carbon, which is six. And then there's a nice number on the bottom there, which is 12.01. This once again is our atomic number. This number right here is not the atomic, not the mass number. That is what is known as the atomic mass. 
not the mass number. If you look on the periodic table underneath every symbol, pretty much all the numbers there are decimals. Yes, they are not whole numbers. So they are not the mass number. What confuses people is this. A lot of times the mass number and the number you see on the bottom there are like very close numbers. Yeah, they're very close to each other. But that is not how you figure out the mass number. That's not how you figure out the number of neutrons. You should use the information that's given to you in the problem to do so, and you will be given enough information to do so. Calculate neutrons or calculate mass numbers. You should never, ever, ever, I'll say it one more time, ever write that bottom number for the mass number. If you feel like you want to do that or you need to do that, you should also follow it up with an X. Yes, because that's probably what's going to happen to your, your answer there. So um, they're not the mass number. <laughs> Don't be the person that does that, I hope. Um, let's talk a little bit about isotopes. Uh, isotopes, as I mentioned earlier, are really the same element, but they do have different masses. And what makes them different masses is the number of neutrons. Which particle is the most important in terms of what element we're talking about? It is it the protons, electrons, or neutrons? Which one is the most important in terms of the element we're talking about? It is the protons, the atomic number. So when we have isotopes, because they are the same element, they all have the same atomic number. Otherwise, they would not be the same element. So it is only the number of neutrons that change when we have an isotope. And the way that we typically write them is we use the symbol. And the top left, we put the mass number. Bottom left, we put the atomic number. And that's the very common way we do that. So for example, if we have hydrogen, which has one proton and no neutrons, we have deuterium, which is actually heavy hydrogen, has one proton and one neutron, and tritium, which is the radioactive version of hydrogen, has one proton and two neutrons. If we were to write these symbols with the mass number and atomic number, we would do the following. The number of protons, right, tells us that we could go to the periodic table and find the symbol. So if we weren't sure what hydrogen was, we would go to number one on the periodic table, and I hope number one is hydrogen still, like with an H. And our atomic number would be what we would find there. <laughs> there. And that would go to the bottom left. In this case, the mass number is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, which means for hydrogen, the mass number is up on top. And that would be the correct symbol there with the mass number up here on top. And our atomic number here on the bottom. Now, if we did deuterium, which doesn't sound anything like hydrogen, but it tells us it is one proton. So that is the atomic number. So if you didn't recognize that as being hydrogen, you once again would go to the periodic table, find lucky number one, which still says H at this point. And it still is one for the atomic number, I hope. At this point, if we were going to do the mass number for that guy, it would be one proton plus one neutron is two, which means the mass number for deuterium would be a two on the top left there. Lastly, once again, tritium, which really doesn't sound like hydrogen either, but it tells us it has one proton. So going to the periodic table, one proton again is hydrogen, a little one action on the bottom there. And at this point, we would take uh, one plus two is three, I think, in this case, which would be three. So all three of these guys are the isotopes of hydrogen. As you can see, they all have one proton, which makes them all still hydrogen, even though they have different names. But they do have different mass numbers. One is one, two, and three. Typically speaking, when it is written like this, you take the top number minus the bottom number, it gives you the number of neutrons. So one minus one is zero, two minus one is one, and three minus one is two. So you take the top number minus the bottom number, gives you the number of neutrons. Any questions on that there? Another way sometimes isotopes are written is like this, like Cu64. This number here, is the mass number, yeah? I know it's the mass number because if I wanted to figure out what copper's atomic number would be, I should go where? 
Where should I go? Anyone? How would I find Copper's atomic number? Not look for 64, but we would want to go to the periodic table. Yeah. And we would want to look for CU. And above CU, I think it still says 29. It's like I've done this once or twice. That's good. So it says 29. So when you go to the periodic table, you would look up CU. Above it would say 29. And that would tell you that that is the atomic number. And that's how I know for sure that that is not the mat that is not the atomic number in there. So if we wrote this in the other way, on the bottom would go 29, right? Which would be the atomic number. Up on top would go 64. That means that this guy here has how many protons? It does have 29. How many electrons does it have? It does have 29. It doesn't have a charge. By the way, we know it doesn't have a charge because there's nothing written here. Yeah. So if it did have a charge, let's say plus one, plus two, something like that. But nothing's written. So we can assume it's neutral. So this guy would have 29 protons, which are positively charged. They would all be balanced out by 29 electrons, which are negatively charged. So 29 positives and 29 negatives give you zero. Number of neutrons would be? Not 64, 64 is the mass number, which is the number of protons and the number of neutrons. So how do I find the number of neutrons? I take the mass number, which is the number on top, and I subtract it from the atomic number, which is the number of protons. So I'm basically taking the number of neutrons and protons minus the number of protons. 64 minus 29 is a lot, but it's 35 maybe, I don't know. All right, I'll trust you. You sound like you know. So this is 35. I grab that here, maybe. This is 35 neutrons in this case. And again, that would be 64 minus 29 would get us there. And obviously, uh, 29 protons and 29 electrons. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, why don't we try some here, maybe. All right, so for each of these, figure out how many protons, electrons, and neutrons there are. Okay, let's take a look and see. So we'll start here with uh, CO, which is cobalt, right? And uh, in this case, uh, we know it's neutral as there's nothing written there. So we assume that's zero charge. Top number is the mass number, right? Bottom number is the atomic number. So that means this guy would have how many protons? It would be 27 protons. Since it is neutral, it should have a matching number of electrons. If I could write the number, 27. Again, 27 positives and 27 negatives give you zero overall charge. Number of neutrons is found by taking our mass number, right? Minus our atomic number. So in this case, we would take 60 minus 27. Looks like a 33 in that case, yeah. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> Coming down to the next one, which is Cl, which is chlorine. Once again, we do not see anything written there, so we know that it is neutral. Our number of protons in this case would then be 17. Our number of electrons will again match it to balance it out to zero, which gives us zero charge. And our number of neutrons, once again, we'll take the top number, which is the mass number, minus the atomic number. Uh, so that's going to be a 37 minus 17. That looks like a 20, maybe, in this case. Yeah. Any questions on that one there? All right, lastly, U, which is uranium. Uh, again, no charge. So starting with our protons. Uh, we will do uh, 92, which should be the bottom number. Once again, matching number of electrons would be 92. And our number of proton, a uh, number of neutrons, number of electrons there, number of neutrons uh, would be 238 minus 92. Seems like a lot, 146 maybe, yeah, give or take. Any questions on any of those there? 
All right. So let's try a few more here. All right, so let's try this one. Krypton, uh, Adam has 48 neutrons. So if we wanted to write this symbol with the mass number and the atomic number, Krypton symbol is KR, yeah. Now, what should I do? I should go to periodic table, look at Krypton and above Krypton, what is the number it says? 30. Six, yes, so I should say 36. That 36 would be what number? That would be the atomic number, which should end up over here on my bottom left. Now, how would I find the mass number in this case? It would be my atomic number, which is the number of protons plus what number? number of neutrons, right? That's the mass number. So that's 48. Uh, so that's 36 plus 48 gives you 84 in this case, yes? Any questions on that there? Okay. All right, how about nitrogen? Why don't you write the symbol for that one with the mass number and atomic number? So if we do nitrogen on the periodic table, the number above it is seven, yes? So that once again is the atomic number, which means it should go on the bottom left. Mass number would be our atomic number plus the number of neutrons, which was given to us, which would be in this case 13. And that would go top left, yeah. Question on that one there. All right, lastly here, uh, iron has a mass number of 56. Also figure out the protons, electrons, and neutrons. Iron symbol again is Fe on the periodic table. Uh, like Look here, so it did say 26, I hope above it, yes. And that means again, that's going to be our atomic number. Uh, which should go bottom left. In this case, it actually gave us the mass number of 56, which would go top left. This means in this case, the uh, number of protons iron has is 26, which is the bottom number. Number of electrons should match since it's neutral, which would be 26. And our number of neutrons would be our mass number, which is 56 minus 26 gives you 30 in terms of your um, mass, in terms of your number of neutrons. Any questions on mass number, atomic number, protons, electrons, neutrons, how to calculate any of those things? Because we have a minute or two. What happens if we did have, say, something with a charge? How does that affect things? So. Let's say that we had, we'll use the nitrogen there, nitrogen 13, seven. Let's say it actually had a minus three charge. Things with charges are what are referred to as ions. So those are things with charges. And there's really two types. There's cations, which are positively charged. And there's anions, which are negatively charged. So if I look at this guy, the number of protons in this anion is how many? It is still seven, right? Because it's nitrogen, that is still the atomic number there. Number of neutrons in this case would still be 13 minus seven, which would be six, right? So what we could clearly see here is uh, obviously protons stay the same. Why do the protons stay the same? If I change the number of protons, does it stay the same element? It does not, so you should never ever change the protons. So when things get charges, it's only the electrons that change. So how many electrons would we have in this case? It would actually be 10 electrons, yeah? 
10 negative things right minus are added to seven positive things leaves you negative three left over which is where the charge comes from the negative in the charge tells you that it actually gained electrons from the neutral guy the neutral nitrogen had seven electrons so it actually gained electrons the three tells you how many gained the neutral guy had seven minus three means it gained three electrons and gives you 10 total electrons all together. Question on that one there. We had iron as well. We'll look at that one, 56, 26, iron plus two. Number of protons in this guy would still be 26. Number of neutrons would still be 56 minus 26, which is 30, just like we had down here. The number of electrons in this case would be 24, actually. 24 negative guys. 26 positive guys plus 24 negative guys leaves you two positive guys left over, yes? Which is where the charge comes from. The positive charge tells you that it actually lost electrons from the neutral. The neutral iron had 26 electrons. This guy has only 24 and the number tells you how many it lost. So the neutral guy had 26. The plus two means it lost two electrons to 24, basically. So things that actually get charges, really the only thing that changes is the number of electrons and it ends up with a negative charge. You need to add however many electrons there are, the charges to the neutral guy. You can actually add it right to the atomic number. So the atomic number for nitrogen was seven. Minus three means add three, seven and three is 10, which would be how many electrons it has. Anything that has a positive charge means it lost electrons from the neutral guy. So what you would do actually is subtract the charge from the number of protons. So 26 minus two would give you 24 electrons. So uh, things with charges, the only thing that changes is the number of electrons. That's how ionic compounds are formed. Metals lose electrons, non-metals gain electrons. That's when they gain charges. And now we have the same attraction that we talked about earlier, positive, negative guy, gonna go stick themselves together because they're gonna be attracted to one another because they both have a charge. Any questions on that there? All right, we will lay it up there for today.